Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's time to start your gardening week. So let's get into some questions, discussion. Today's primary topic is going to be soil and how you can make your soil better. But let's go ahead and start with a question from Shandy's Garden. I'm wondering if I should go ahead and cut my tomatoes off with a nice dry and cool week on tap in the 60s here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Low 40s at night and I still have a ton out there. This is a great question because many of us are having to confront this towards the end of our growing season when the temperatures start to cool in fall. And especially our favorite plants like tomatoes still have a lot of tomatoes on the plants and we want to be able to harvest as many of them as possible. So I look at this in two different ways. First off, when the nighttime temperatures start dropping below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, that's when I usually top my tomato plants. I'll pinch off the growing tips. I'll cut off any young suckers because the plants just aren't going to grow when they start getting cool like that. As long as the daytime temperatures are warm, the plant's going to be okay. And if it's sunny, photosynthesis is going to happen and that energy will go into the fruit. But those cooler nighttime temperatures are going to limit pollen production and flower growth. And you might get a lot of blossom drops drop off of those plants when the temperatures dip. But the fruit that's on the plant should be okay. And as, as long as you leave it on your plant, it's getting energy from the plant. It may slow down in the cooler temperatures. The plant itself might not be growing as much, but all the plant wants to do is propagate. It wants to put its energy into seed production for the next season. And those seeds are going to be in the tomatoes. So leave the fruit on the plant as long as possible so that it will mature and ripen. It's going to be slower than at the peak of the, the summer, but it's still going to happen. And then when that frost and freeze threatens, then you can go ahead and harvest the remaining green tomatoes or slightly ripened tomatoes and put them indoors. It's ethylene gas at that point that causes the tomatoes to ripen. And so a, a nice little fun experiment is to take those tomatoes that are green that haven't fully matured yet, put some on your counter and they'll ripen. Put some others on your counter right next to a banana and they'll ripen faster. And it's all because of that ethylene gas. So kind of fun, but yeah, uh, go ahead and leave them on the plant rather than just cut off the plant or pull the plant or get rid of the plant. Tr try to leave it as long as possible until those cold weather days threaten. And also a question about sweet potato vines. I've been looking at this real closely with my sweet potato vines and needing to figure out when to pull them. Look like we were talking about last week at the forecasts that are coming up because you should try to harvest your sweet potatoes just before that first frost. If you're late, the frost is going to kill the leaves. You should definitely harvest right away because the, the dead leaves are no longer servicing the plant, but it could actually pose some potential problems if you leave the sweet potatoes in the ground after the plants have actually died from a frost or a freeze. So look at the forecast. The longer you can leave them in the ground, the bigger they're going to get. And that's really the reason you want to try to delay as long as possible. And then right before the frost, harvest the sweet potatoes. Now there's a lot of other plants that you should leave in the ground until after that first frost. The carrots, the beets, root vegetables in general can actually develop more flavor after they've been exposed to that first frost. It's, it, it's a survival mechanism for the plants. The frost comes, the plant knows that it's going to die, or at least the leaves are going to die soon. So it starts sending all of the energy from the leaves back into the roots. 
And so I'm sure many of you can attest that the flavor is better in root vegetables after a frost because all those sugars are now concentrating in the roots. So peppers, tomatoes, squash, melons, eggplant, and sweet potatoes should all be harvested before the frost. But the root vegetables, you've got some more time with, so don't worry too much about those kind of things. So, okay, nice to see everybody here. So many people checking in. Uh, a lot of discussion about food and what people are eating uh, after zucchini bread being taken to a football game. I've actually been having some fun with my zucchini. I've been making zucchini bread this week, but my freeze dryer, this is the first week I've had it. I'm already in love with it, and I'm making some videos about it. And one of the videos I'm making is about the zucchini and all the different ways I'm freeze drying zucchini and how I'm planning to use it. And so one of my experiments that I really hope to be successful is that I took shredded zucchini and then I put it into my freeze dryer and dried it. And now I'm going to rehydrate that shredded zucchini to make banana bread or not banana bread, zucchini bread, because I love zucchini bread. So I'll make zucchini bread with my fresh zucchini. Now I'm going to see if I can make zucchini bread with my freeze dried zucchini. So I'm filming the whole thing and of course I'll share it with you, but I'm having a lot of fun with that harvest dried freeze dryer as, as I'm doing all of the, the harvests and, and trying to save as much as possible. Hi, Tony. Tony from Simplified Gardening is here today, able to chat for about 15 minutes and then on his way to work. So good to see you here today, Tony, and I talk about Tony all the time on the live stream because lots of good information over there on the Simplify Gardening channel. And Jay's on top of things. Thank you to Jay and Heidi, our fantastic moderators, with a link to Tony's channel. So, uh, so nice to see everybody. Greg is checking in from Omaha. And I saw Pat checking in earlier from Trinidad. That's so nice to see. Denise is wondering, why would my carrots turn black and soft after taking them out of the ground? So um, there are there are some diseases that will affect uh, root vegetables, many of them, carrots in particular. And so it, it's probably uh, the storage. There's a couple things that could be an issue when the root vegetables rot early. And it's usually a, a result of a disease and you can look online for the specific images that that you'll find with your carrots if they're turning black or brown or sometimes um, they get mushy and so the different diseases will ca cause different results in some of those root vegetables and so you can just do a quick search and it should tell you exactly which one you probably have based on uh, the carrots turning black and soft and and with root vegetables, when you harvest them, they shouldn't turn color and they shouldn't turn mushy. So that's a clear indication that there's some other factor at play. If you've been storing your carrots for nine months and then they start to get mushy, that's a storage issue and the fact that they won't store forever. But it's happening. If it's happening right away, that's an exterior factor. And this is one of those instances where you you can look at the the type of disease because carrots in particular you can find varieties of carrot that are resistant to some of those kind of carrot diseases so in the future if you know that you have that particular problem with any plant this holds true across the board not just carrots if you have a disease that affects your plant start looking to grow varieties that are resistant to whatever that disease happens to be. And so for instance, on tomatoes, on a plant tag, you might see a VFN. And so that tells you that that plant is resistant to the V is verticillium wilt, the F is fusarium. And so it's, it's that extra step in gardening where you don't have to accept disease in your garden. Once you know what the disease is, you can take measures to prevent the disease or at least reduce the disease. And then if you pick the plants that are resistant, 
you can essentially eradicate disease. And most of that starts with the soil, which is what I want to talk a lot about today. In the soil, many of those diseases will reside, but in the soil, you can take the measures to get rid of that. And, and so the soil life you have in your garden is critical. And I've, I've said this many times, soil is the key to garden success. The better the soil, the better success you will have. If you look, and, and this is another one of those things you can do a quick search on when you look at what good soil, what constitutes good soil, and you'll see a chart, a little, a little graphic that is the same everywhere. The colors might be slightly different, but it shows that good soil is 45% mineral, 5% organic matter, and then 25% water and 25% air. That's the, the generally accepted definition of good soil, and, and it's graphically represented and on a number of sites. Well, I think the piece that's forgotten and that's left out of that is the life within the soil. Because you can have 45% mineral, 5% organic matter, 25% water, 25% air, and not be able to grow plants at all. Because if that soil is sterile, the plants won't grow. You have to have that life. And the reason the 5% organic matter is so important is because that's what's feeding all the life within your soil. And the more you delve into this amazing topic, the more you find out that that life can battle the bad stuff that moves in. So those diseases, those bad nematodes, the bad bacteria, the bad fungi that can actually harm your plants, the good counterpart, counterparts that you're developing in your soil can battle all of that. It can fight it off. And so it's, it's one of those things that I like to use nature to my benefit. And one of the ways I can do that is by building good soil. And I think all of you should, should start thinking about that. So start thinking in terms of uh, what you can do. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. What are you already doing and what more can you do with a focus on good soil? Because the good soil is going to fight off the bad stuff and feed and benefit your plants all at the same time. So uh, good, fantastic way to to start thinking about it. Uh, Tony's got his studio complete. And so uh, Tony did a, a live recently. He's done a couple of them. Uh, been working on his studio. So yeah, let's get together, Tony, and we'll do a live together and you can uh, be at your new studio and looking forward to a lot of those new videos as well. Uh, John's wondering, uh, just north of me in Aurora, Colorado, and when to plant the garlic. And so we talked about this recently, last week or the week before, I think, in, in the live stream. And so garlic generally goes in the ground about a month, four to six weeks in general, before the ground starts to freeze. Here in Colorado, on this side of the mountain, on the front range, it's typically about the first week of October. So I'm planning on putting my garlic in next week and that will give me four to six weeks before the ground really starts to freeze which here in colorado is the beginning to the middle of november and that's why the beginning of october for us is a good time you'll for the rest of you you'll need to get to know a little bit more about your garden and your area in particular and when your ground freezes and when the frosts come it's usually a good idea to put the garlic in the ground when that first frost, hit, first frost hits. Because many of our weather patterns all around the world, the frost hits and about four to six, four to six weeks later, the ground begins to freeze because it takes that long for the ground to cool down after the temperatures start getting into that 
realm around freezing. And so for us here in Colorado on the Front Range, first week of October is usually a general guideline. And that corresponds to the, the time that is needed before the ground just gets too cold. So, okay, let's see, scrolling down, lots of recipes back and forth, some good information about zucchini. I'm really looking forward to having some fun with the zucchini from my freeze dryer, that's fun. Just Thaddles is saying, I'm currently working on prepping new beds, raised beds for next spring. Any extra tips on cheap things to add now that will break down and help the soil for next season? Great question. And that's on my list. That's why I want to talk about this kind of stuff today. Because I've said this many times before, and, and many, many of you have heard me say it before. I think fall, this autumn time, is the best time of year to prepare your garden, period. It's for next year. You're doing this many months in advance, but that's what makes this time of year so good. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere right now, it's not too late because the second best time of year is in early spring. So be it early spring or early fall, that's a good time of year to start focusing on improving your soil because remember the life of the soil is what's critical it's the bacteria it's the fungi it's the nematodes it's the arthropods it's all of the life in your soil that makes a difference because those organisms are eating the organic matter that you put in and eating each other and that's what's releasing the nutrients in a form that the plants can use. That often takes time. If you put some chunky organic matter in your soil, you can have billions of bacteria, but that bacteria is going to take a long time to break down that chunky material. Give them the time. Doing it in the fall, I think is great because a lot of that material can can be initially decomposed. The life in the soil begins to populate the, the soil in whatever bed, in ground or raised bed or container. And then when winter sets in, especially for those of us with harsh winters, many of those organisms are going to go dormant. Some will die, but that's okay because then their carcasses become food for other organisms. And, and so think of it this way, that, that a bacteria will eat some of that organic matter. And that organic matter has the nutrients that the plants need. Those nutrients aren't released into the soil. They still reside within the bacteria. That bacteria then has to be decomposed by other bacteria for those nutrients to be released or eaten by another organism. Now those nutrients are inside the new organism and the same thing needs to happen. That organism needs to be decomposed so it's released into the soil or eaten by another organism and now those nutrients are in, in the new organism. And so as you look at this cycle, it, it's called the, the soil food web and Dr. Elaine Ingham has become quite well known for for developing and then promoting this idea where you have all of these individual organisms that are food for other organisms and this entire circle of life inside the soil is what's releasing all of the nutrients back into the soil that the plants can use it takes some time which is why doing it in the fall is an ideal time for for doing this because what's not decomposed, what's not eaten in autumn and stays in the soil in winter is eaten and broken down and released, released as nutrients in spring just before you're putting the plants in the ground. So now when you're starting your seeds and starting your plants in mid to late spring, those nutrients are there ready to be used for the plants because you prepared it months ahead of time. And so as to cheap things to add to break down the soil or break down in the soil for next year, that's all I use is cheap things. I use the, the grass clippings from a lawn. I use crushed leaves. 
I used compost that I make myself of all varying levels. It doesn't have to be fully decomposed compost. It can still be chunky compost and work it into your soil in fall. It's all the mulches that I use. I use the same grass and leaves and straw as mulch on my soil. And then I'll turn that into the soil. Just turn it upside down, and I've got videos on this, so that it's inside the soil to start breaking down. You really only need to think about doing this for the top six to eight inches of soil because that's where most of the roots are. That's where most of these organisms reside. So you don't have to think about deep digging and amending an entire raised bed. We're only talking about the surface. So all this organic matter that I put on the surface and an easy way to do it is just to spread two inches of compost or three inches of compost if you're still building the soil and then just turn it upside down so at the the depth of a of a of a spade or a shovel so you put your your spade or i like to use a garden fork into the soil and just turn it upside down and all that stuff that was on the surface is now four or five inches deep into the soil all ready to break down with those soil organisms going to work and then you put something new on top. You put more mulch or you put a cover crop that will grow in the fall and may or may not survive through the winter. And then in the spring, I'll do the same thing again. Depending on how much effort I'm putting into building the soil, especially new beds that I want better soil, then in the spring I do the same thing again. If I'm growing a cover crop for the purpose of enriching the soil with that biomass that I'm growing, then in early spring, as soon as I can work the soil, I do the same thing. I turn those plants back into the soil to become food for the soil food web, and then I put another mulch on top of the soil. So the soil is always covered. There's always something on top of it, either a plant or a mulch or both a mulch and a plant. And all of that is helping to enrich the soil. So as far as cheap things, I, I don't buy anything to throw into my soil. It's all whatever I can find around me in my garden and yard space. And so uh, go for it, just faddles, because it's one of those things that takes some effort. And I've got videos on all of this. I've got videos that show what I do in the fall, and I've got videos on what I do in the spring. The idea is that you just keep doing it. Chris is wondering, I have an I, ibis, I wonder if that's iris that spends every, oh, ibis, okay, that spends every day in the garden digging holes with his beak. Ibis is a bird that we don't have in Colorado and taking my valuable worms. I heard he's a gardener's friend, however, what do you think? So this is one of those things that, uh, that again, working with nature rather than working against nature. There are going to be thousands if not millions of worms in your soil if you just take a single trowel and put it into your soil and pull it out and there are two or three worms in that trowel or even just a single earthworm in that scoop of soil imagine that every scoop you would make in your entire garden has at least one worm in it and so when an ibis comes and takes a few of your worms, I, I don't think it's that that bad a deal. The, the bird is going to leave behind droppings, which become a natural fertilizer when that manure breaks down. But for some of us, I have very dense soil. And one of the nice things about a long beaked bird like an ibis is it's aerating your soil. And so remember, a good soil, 25% of good soil is air. And one of the things that causes our plants to become stunted and not grow as well as they could is compacted soil. So anything that can aerate the soil is a good thing. Earthworms are great at aerating the soil. Ants are great at aerating the soil. And a bird sticking its beak in the ground to pull out a worm is aerating the soil. So. I, I actually think that that's a, a kind of a nice thing. And that's probably why they're considered a gardener's friend. They're aerating the soil. They're leaving behind a natural fertilizer. 
And it just shows that you have a garden in balance, that nature is working with itself to maintain a balance. There are more and more earthworms out there. The, the jumping worm in particular that's becoming an, a problem and the Asian worm. And so if the birds are coming in and eating the excess worms, that also helps keep it in balance. So that's what I think. I think it actually can be a good thing on a number of different levels. So hope that helps out. I'd, I'd love to see something like that. Urban Chicken Mama is wondering, how can I treat my greenhouse soil and walls so the powdery mildew that was all over my squash plants won't come back next year? Baking soda spray. And so um, the what I would do at the, the school greenhouse, the Galileo School greenhouse, uh, in, in autumn or in early spring, I would do a complete cleanup of the greenhouse to include sterilizing the, wa the walls or, or some of the beds in particular with a 10% bleach solution. And it all depends on how much effort you're going to put into it. But when it comes to something like powdery mildew, my basic philosophy is you're going to have it. You can treat it at the time. If the plant has powdery mildew on it, you can do a baking soda spray. You can do a milk spray. You can do an antifungal spray. There's things you can do to deal with the powdery mildew. My squash had powdery mildew relatively early this year. Gradually, my cucumbers got the powdery mildew. Recently, my pumpkins now have powdery mildew. I think it's more work to try to combat it than to just accept that it's going to happen, even inside a greenhouse. Those spores are in the air. The only way to keep it out of your greenhouse is to completely sterilize the greenhouse and then keep any outside air from coming in. And I think that's just not possible. So, so cleaning a, general, a greenhouse in general is a good idea considering spraying when you have powdery mildew first show up so that it doesn't spread too quickly is a good idea or like I do just accept it because it's going to happen every year regardless of what you do it's just a question of whether you accept that or not and how much you want to want to combat it and so uh, a, a baking soda spray in the greenhouse after the fact I think it's going to have a minimal effect because those spores are already going to be on the outside and the inside of your greenhouse and they're going to be in the air next year. So um, the, the soil itself, you can reduce some of the likelihood again by mulch. Mulch is soil's best friend. All of those diseases that are in the soil will eventually be eaten by the soil organisms. When you put a mulch on top of the soil, you're keeping those diseases in the soil. What often happens, especially you'll see this with some of the tomato diseases where they're soil borne. And if you don't have a mulch, anytime it rains and anytime you water, that the drops of water will hit the soil and, and kind of bounce back up. Well, they'll hit the soil, they'll soak up the bacteria, or the spores that cause disease and bounce back up onto the leaves of the plant. Now you've got disease in your tomatoes, and this happens across the board with all kinds of plants that are susceptible to soil-borne diseases. By putting a mulch on top of the soil, you get the same rain, you get the same water. Now it doesn't bounce. It just soaks through the mulch into the soil and you reduce the likelihood of those kind of diseases. And for every bad thing that's going to happen to your plants, there's something in the soil that would find that a food to eat. And that's just incredible to me. That, and, and this holds true actually with pesticides and herbicides. There are bacteria that will break down those harmful chemicals when they get into the soil. And so when you do uh, a little further research on some of those chemicals, you'll see that their half-life above the soil is a certain amount of time and their half-life in the soil is almost always less time. And so some of the herbicides that, 
that I've talked about in months past that might be on straw, for instance, or hay, they'll have a half-life of maybe six months to a year. In the soil, their half-life becomes three to four weeks in most cases. And it's because of that soil life and that nice moist environment that breaks down the harmful chemicals. It takes away some of those diseases. It might take some time, but that's what will happen. And so you'll often see if you know your bed has a particular type of disease that affects a particular plant, don't grow that same plant in that bed the next year, absolutely. But this raises the question, because most of the advice is, depending on the disease, wait three years or wait five years before you plant again. Well, that's because that's how much time it takes for that particular disease, the spores or the bacteria to be broken down and eliminated from the soil. And it's the soil life that's doing all of that. So uh, I know many of you know this, but I just have a, a love for soil life. And it's one of those things that it's just, it just the whole thing fascinates me. Heather Ari, good morning to you in Montana. And thank you so much planting garlic this week. Yep, that would make sense in Montana. I hope you have a great day too. Laura saying hello to everyone from Minnesota. Nice to see you as well, Laura. And I know I'm falling behind with a lot of stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll through, scroll through and see what else I can go ahead and catch up with so I'm not too far off. Let's see that Tony has already left. And so nice to always have Tony here on uh, any time we can get him. But yeah, if we if he and I can get together for a live stream either on his channel or my channel, we were we will definitely do that. So uh, okay, let's see. Um yeah, there you go. This is actually a good point that I wanted to bring up as well, uh, that Carla's saying about distributing in a low rate in the soil. You want to try to keep your soil moist all the time. And so when Carla's saying if it dries out, it can get hydrophobic, it, 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 it's yes, absolutely. So hydrophobic means that the soil will repel water. And so you can see this with with peat moss and and actually you might be talking about peat and you might be talking about cocoa core as well those are hydrophobic materials when they get wet they'll retain the water but then when they dry out they repel water and it takes a long time for them to get to the point where they start absorbing water again many of our soils are the same way when they're moist they'll retain water and every time you you go out and add more water or it rains that water just stays in the soil if a a moist soil can actually hold a lot more water than a dry soil because dry soil tends to be hydrophobic much of it will run off before it gets absorbed so right off the bat keep your soil moist so that it will retain more water but more importantly all those organisms that we're talking about that are in the soil they're alive and and life needs water that's why good soil has 25 percent water and 25 percent air the organisms in the soil need air and water and so too often at the end of the season or even before the start of the season we don't think about watering our beds because there's no plants growing in the bed. You shouldn't think that way at all. You should think about feeding the life in your soil and keeping your soil alive. So after I've pulled my last plant of the season and then I put mulch on the soil, I continue to water that bed. I water that bed until the, the hose freezes and the soil is too cold. And then in spring, as soon as the temperatures start to warm up again, long before I put my first plant in that bed, I'm watering that bed. I want the soil to stay moist. I want those organisms to be alive so that they can do their work making the nutrients available to the plants. And so water, water is key. And, and even in 
in winter when my my hose is frozen but the days warm up usually when the days are warming up to uh, above 40 degrees Fahrenheit that's about four and a half Celsius when the days are that warm even though the nights are gonna be cold the top inch or two of soil is gonna start thawing out in the warmth of the Sun I'll go out with a watering can and just water the top of the soil just so it doesn't dry out completely and the mulch helps moderate this the soil moisture during those critical months when it can dry out so quickly and so particularly here in Colorado in the spring thousands and thousands of people start watering their lawns and huge sections of their front lawn is dead It's because they didn't water during the winter it's called winter kill because the soil dries out then the plant dries out then the plant dies and then in spring you think oh I'll water my plants well they're dead because you didn't water during the warm days of winter it's not only for the plant it's for the soil organisms as well so as the days start to get colder for most of us start thinking about water and its importance to your soil okay let's see nice to see everybody and Hack one ca is saying I have one question first time composting and the temperature did hit a little over 180 degrees Fahrenheit well that's really hot I've read that bacteria will die off should I be worried no um, so yes yes and no so um, you you really don't need to get your compost pile that hot that that's incredibly incredibly high about 160 degrees is is more of a, a target 160 degrees Fahrenheit when it starts getting that hot get in there and you can turn the pile to cool it off because the thermophilic bacteria those are the bacteria that are generating those high temperatures they can be killed off if it gets too hot and so those bacteria are what allow your pile to stay in that 140 to 160 degree range which is hot enough to kill the fungal spores the diseases the weed seeds all of those things are killed off when the temperature gets that high in the pile but especially when it gets to that hot it's going to start killing off the bacteria that is doing all of the work and so you, you, you you'll often see the temperature of a pile plummet when it gets to that high because all of the bacteria have been killed and the pile just cools off dramatically and it takes time to build back that soil life or that bacterial life in your compost so um, try to try to look at a high end of about 160 degrees Fahrenheit and and then you know it's a little bit healthier and it's not a terrible thing because that also probably means that your compost is pretty close to being finished but it's nicer to have a slower cool down because as the pile cools down the other bacteria like the mesophilic bacteria will come back into play and they'll give you a fully finished compost and that's if, if, if that's what you're after that fully finished fine beautiful light compost a gradual increase and a gradual decrease in temperature is much better than those high temperatures and then just a dr dramatic drop off um, but I'm impressed that's hard to get a pile that hot I've never been able to get a pile that hot so good for you it shows that you're doing a lot of other things uh, right and that's exactly what what I think is a good idea sunset gazing has a great idea put a large sign on a table right take what you need but leave some for others and don't understand uh, though some people don't understand the differences between needs and wants and so I know uh, many of you and I think that's what some of the discussion is going on when you set up a table with either your harvest or your plants or your seeds at this time of year as being a nice gardener and sharing it with others and yes often a sign is a good thing my daughter and her daughters paint stones little garden stones for decoration and they have a take one leave one sign up 
and they occasionally find that a whole bunch of new ones have been put into place. So take one, leave one tends to be the kind of sign that often works if it's an exchange, but if you're giving things away, um, often you're going to find out that the expectation that someone's only going to take one or two is going to turn into them taking 10 or 20. And it's, it's not always fun to think that one person is getting everything that you're giving away, but sometimes you just kind of have to accept that that's going to be the way that it is. So, okay, let's see. Uh, and I missed what you said, Brian, but I can see that that's what is generating a lot of this discussion. So I'll go back and catch up later on to see what's going on. Uh, rudimental gardening, built a soil reclamation box to hold all my container soilless mix between se seasons, including any mulch used. Do you think adding earthworms will be beneficial to build the soil life? Possibly. And so when you look at earthworms, there are a number of different types of earthworms, and they basically fall into three type, three categories. And so you have your your um, your big worms, the night crawlers, the ones that are are long, and you take two hands to pull out of the ground, and you go out at night with your flashlight if you can go fishing, and you pull out the night crawlers underneath the faucet, and they're huge, and it's a great thing to do as a kid. Those are deep burrowing earthworms, and so the they're native to your area in particular, and when winter comes, they burrow deep, and they'll survive the winter with no problems. And then when the soil thaws out, they crawl back up and they enjoy their life, potentially at some point becoming fish food. And then there's a second type of earthworm that also burrows relatively deeply, and these are the kind that you may find in your garden. I occasionally dig them up in the spring when I'm turning my, my uh, cover crops back into my soil. I will often uncover at a depth of eight inches these little earthworms that are in little balls that they'll basically uh, just, you know, they might be a six inch earthworm or a four inch earthworm, and they'll crawl into a little ball when the soil starts getting cold. And then when the soil freezes, their own body heat in that tight little ball is enough to help them survive the winter. <coughs> and then you've got a third type of earthworm that only lives in the top couple inches of the soil. And so a lot of the composting earthworms that we have, the verma compost worms, like the red wigglers, and the European night crawlers. They'll, they just live in uh, the, the top couple inches and they'll be killed off by those cold temperatures of winter. So in a container, if you were to put those first two types of earthworms, they would die because they need that, that space to burrow. They need to go deep. They need to, to travel across the garden. But if you put that third type of earthworm into your potting mix and whatever else you're adding to it, they'll eat it until the temperatures get so cold that it kills them. So I, I don't do too much of that. Uh, it is beneficial, beneficial to building the life in that mix and it, it, those worms will break down some of that organic matter. But you really need to focus on a that particular type of worm in a container of organic material like that. So Shamim Sufi, my compost bin just does not break down. I have difficulty tuning up the material. Any solution to this? A, a lot of compost success comes down to the ingredients, the recipe you're using, how many greens, how much nitrogen material, and how many of the browns, the carbon material that you have in your mix. If it's too brown, if there's too many carbon materials, it's gonna stop decomposing. You've gotta have the nitrogen in the pile. And this happens to me all the time when I just add material to my compost pile and it dries and nothing happens. I'm just trying to build a big enough mass so that I can then add the nitrogen component. And that's usually the fix. If you've got a pile that's too dry, that's got too many browns, it's too carbon rich, the fix is to now 
change the ratio to bring more car more nitrogen material in that fresh green grass that was just cut from a lawn you throw that in the 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 green clippings from the plants that are still alive as you clean up your garden you throw those into the compost pile you're adding those those nitrogen ingredients then you're mixing up the pile then you can expect to see the temperatures rise you can expect to see the bacterial growth that's going to decompose all that organic matter and if if the mix is perfect along with moisture it needs to be consistently moist because the bacteria need that moisture and by turning it so you've got the oxygen <coughs> you can get to 180 degrees fahrenheit it's very possible but you got to have that proper mix of the nitrogen materials and the carbon materials or like like you're saying it just won't break down if it's too much nitrogen it tends to start smelling it tends to be uh, become anaerobic and so if it's not a smelly pile it's probably a carbon problem or the pile is too dry or there's not enough oxygen so keep the pile wet turn it to get the, the oxygen in there and then make sure you're adding the nitrogen material and that's usually a good fix for everything that's going on hi pat nice to see you here today thanks for that super chat soil amendment recommended for asparagus in the fourth season and so that's a that's a good question um i'm going to i've been filming it now for two years and so next year i'll actually be releasing my asparagus video that shows how to grow asparagus over a three-year period and what i did in the third year is the same thing that i do in the fourth year the the fronds hopefully and i'm guessing you you do allow the fronds to grow so the fronds should be growing nice and green still but as soon as they start turning brown you can go ahead and cut them down and then i start doing the same thing with my asparagus soil that i do with all the other soils in my garden i will put organic matter on top of the soil and I also like to use manures, particularly in the fall and particularly on asparagus beds. I like to use manure and compost. And generally on my asparagus bed, and this is what I did last year with alpaca manure. So I'll put a layer of alpaca manure, and then I'll put an inch or two of compost. And then on top of that, I'll put a light mulch, usually crushed up leaves, and a little bit of straw. And that's what I do with my asparagus beds. I do the same thing in many of my other beds. The difference is in the other beds, I'll usually turn all that material back into the soil so that the soil organisms can start breaking it down. Can't do that in the asparagus bed or else you're gonna disrupt your asparagus plants. And that's why Pat, Pat is asking this question. But all that organic matter is still on top of the soil. Every time you water, every time it rains, when the snow melts, some of the nutrients in that organic matter are going to leach into the soil. But even though it's only happening at the interface between the organic matter and the top of the soil, there are going to be soil organisms breaking down that material as well. So it's, it's a mulch because it's something we're putting on top of the soil. But at that interface, at that critical, and it's only about a quarter inch, maybe a half inch deep, the decomposition is happening. And that material is being broken down and carried into the soil below, and it will enrich the asparagus. And so pretty much every autumn, that's what I do with my asparagus bed. And then in spring, I'll add more mulch just to cover all that organic matter for it continue to break down over the course of the summer. Earthworms are gonna play a big part in that. Beetles are gonna play a big part in that. Mealy bugs are gonna play a big part in that. A lot of those insects that we get annoyed with are breaking down that material. Earwigs fall into that category as well. There's a lot of these insects in our garden. Their role is to break down the organic matter into smaller pieces. And so when you put the organic matter on top of the soil, the 
the soil life and those other organisms are going to break it down. That's the basic idea behind no dig gardening, where you just add compost on top of the soil every year and that's it. And then let mother nature do all the work to break that down and carry it into the soil where it can achieve its benefits. And so if you are, are a proponent of no dig gardening, growing asparagus just follows those same methods. It's no dig gardening in an asparagus bed by putting compost or whatever organic, other organic matter you want to use into your garden space. And, and it works pretty well. I, I haven't had any problems. I've been growing asparagus for years and that's what I do is just keep adding more organic matter every year and it replaces the nutrients that the asparagus is using. Hi, Craig. Thank you so much for that super chat. I appreciate it. Hypothetical question. If I feed my plants with compost created from veg that was fed exclusively with synthetic fertilizer, would my resulting vegetables be considered organic? I think yes. For me, organic is a way of gardening. I am an organic gardener. I don't use any chemicals in my garden. I let nature do what it does in my garden. I use compost that I make. I use the mulches that are naturally occurring in my garden. That makes me an organic gardener because I'm just following methods and a philosophy of organic gardening. Now, I know some people don't want to have anything that touches anything that's not certified organic. And that's the big differentiation in this question, I think. If you are using materials or chemicals, there's a lot of chemicals that are certified organic, that's one way to approach organic gardening is to use the materials and the chemicals and, and whatever else that you might be gardening with that's been certified organic, which involves a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, a lot of money for those growers and those producers to be considered organic. That's definitely one way you can approach organic gardening is just always using certified organic materials to include compost that you buy and seeds that you buy and fertilizers that you buy and whatever else you want to use in the garden. Now we move into a slightly different realm, which is just the science behind how plants grow. Plants use nutrients. There are six macronutrients. Th the three most common and the three that are most used by the plants are nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. There are a whole bunch of micronutrients that the plants need as well. That's what's coming from the soil. That's why I think it's important to add the organic matter and to get that soil life going in your garden because those nutrients are then released to the plants. You can use artificial or in, in, in this case, the synthetic fertilizers that are doing the same thing. Instead of putting organic matter into the soil and then that, that, that vegetable that you buried that's now decomposed by the bacteria and the nematodes and the fungi and everything else, and they release those nutrients back into the soil and the plant absorbs those nutrients and grows. If you put a synthetic fertilizer into your soil, the plant doesn't know the difference. The plant is just absorbing nutrients from the soil. It could be synthetic. It could be naturally occurring because all of the soil life, the plant doesn't care. The plant grows because it needs those macro and those micronutrients. And when it finds those nutrients, it's alive and it's growing and it's giving you the harvest that you want. And so purely from a scientific perspective, that plant knows no different. That plant is growing. And so if you then took that plant and put it into your compost pile, the microbes in your compost pile have no idea what fed that plant. They can't tell the difference between synthetic fertilizers that the plant ate or the naturally occurring nutrients that the plant ate. To that bacteria in that compost pile, 
it's just a dead plant that they're going to feed on. So I think really the crux of this, Craig, is, is philosophical. If, if you are an organic gardener and you want nothing in your garden that is synthetic, I know people that are this way. They would see that compost as being tainted because the material in that compost was not grown with purely organic method. I, I disagree. A plant is a plant. And if you put it in your compost pile and it produces compost, it really doesn't matter what caused that plant to grow. I don't use fertilizers much at all in my garden. You can make the same argument if you're anti-fertilizer. I'm not anti-fertilizer. I just know that good soil produces all the nutrients that my plants need, and I don't need to add fertilizer. But if I have a container that has a potting mix that is low in nutrients, I'll add fertilizer to that. When it comes to my compost, I'll take the plant from that container that was fed with fertilizers, throw it into my compost pile. My raised beds that I'm not using fertilizer in, I'll pull those plants and throw them into my compost pile. Doesn't matter. Again, the microbes in the compost can't tell a difference. So it's it's a good question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's it's more than just hypothetical. But I, I would definitely consider any plant I grow organic, regardless of how I grew it, once it gets to the compost pile. And if I'm trying to make organic compost, the source of the plant doesn't matter. And it's up to you to decide whether you call it organic or not. Because I certainly do. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much for that super chat. Snails in a new Hugo culture raised bed, 30 to 50 a day in beer traps. Tried diatomaceous earth and copper. Help. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, you can, first off, I would say more traps. Uh, you might want to try rolled up newspaper or cardboard or um, I, I haven't actually used it, but it, I've seen it can be quite effective. Carpet, if you have an old carpet remnant. The idea is around your beds, you lay down wet cardboard or the wet carpet or the wet newspaper and the snails are going to go to that moist, dark environment. And it's just an extra way to trap them. So the beer traps are very effective. As you can see, 30 to 50 a day. That's pretty incredible. But they do take a little bit of effort because you've got to bury them and you've got to fill them with beer and then you've got to empty the snails out of them. Where the, the more large scale traps, like the cardboard trap, might be a little easier to, to trap more of them. This is one of those things where... Uh, it's hard to find out, especially for those of you who, who have problem with snails. They're just everywhere. So it's not like you can find their main nest and then deal with them. You just have to, to look at the garden as a whole. And if there's an area that you can dry out because they, they want moist environment, they want that moist, dark environment, they're going to, to crawl along the ground and find your plants usually at night when it's nice and cool and moist. So if you can dry out the area around your plants, that can also help. I know that can be difficult, but particularly towards the end of the season, if the plants are uh, beginning to suffer anyway, either from snail damage or end of season damage, one of the ways that you can try to reduce your population is just to let your beds dry out. Even though I just said the soil needs to stay moist, when you have a huge snail problem or slug problem, allowing the mulch to dry out and allowing that top layer of soil to dry out can reduce the problem with the snails because they're not typically going to cross a large distance that is dry. They need the moist conditions. So hope that helps a little bit. Copper is one of those things that unless you have a really wide copper band, all the way around your plants or all the way around a bed. I've, I've seen videos, you can find these on YouTube. The, the snails will crawl right across the, the copper. Yeah, they'll get a little zing, but it, it's not as effective a deterrent as many of us are led to believe it is. 
Yeah, it, it might deter some of them, but a lot of snails will just crawl across the copper. And diatomaceous earth is more effective on insects because the diatomaceous earth is made up of microscopic ancient creatures and their skeletons are very sharp to very small insects. So diatomaceous can diatomaceous earth, those diatomes that make that up, are very effective at ripping out the guts of an aphid, but it has almost no effect at all on the tough foot of a snail or a slug. And so trapping is, is really the best way to deal with that kind of problem. And then trying to improve the environment so that there's not as many wanting to come into your garden or to your plants. So uh, I, I know that may not be as specific an answer as you were looking for, but uh, trapping with is is one of the best things you do. Get ducks. So if you really want to take this to a to to an eradication method, ducks love snails, and so I know a lot of people will have chickens. Ducks can be extremely effective at dealing with snail problems. I don't know if that's an option for you or not, but it might be something to consider if you have that option. To, to throw some ducks in your garden. So Craig says, thank you. And also the viewers who took time to reply to the question and the moderators are doing a great job. Thank you, Craig, I appreciate that. Yeah, they always do a great job. And everybody here is always helpful with good information. You know, I'd, I'll often go back and read through the comments and uh, see something. It's like, oh yeah, I wish I would have thought about that. Or, oh yeah, I wish I would have said that. Uh, and so you all are just incredible with the information. And yes, even I can learn things. And occasionally I'll see a comment and it's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And then I'll look into it a little bit more and find out something. And yeah, I'm also learning from you all with some of what you're passing back and forth with your great gardening information. So definitely, thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, Shandy's garden is right. And that's why um, ducks uh, tend to be better than snails because uh, the ducks really aren't interested in pulling up the plants like the chickens are. And like Gardens Happen says, chickens wouldn't touch the snails. So as far as an animal eating the snails, it's, it's the ducks that you want to get. Absolutely. Oh, it looks like Tony's back. So hi, Tony. Nice to see you back. I guess you're maybe you're driving to work and texting after you got there, so nice to see you back. Yankee Sista Homestead, always nice to see you here. Gardener Scott, if I mulch one year old leaves that came from the curbside, should I be afraid of the quality of leaf mulch it will produce? Good topic, thanks always. <coughs> so, talking earlier, worst case scenario, if those leaves were sprayed with some type of pesticide, because uh, typically leaves aren't sprayed with an herbicide. Herbicides are what's going to kill our seedlings if we have contaminated straw or, or hay. The pesticide is less of an issue, but it also has a half-life. And there are very few pesticides, if any, that I'm aware of that have a half-life beyond a year. So if you're worried about what the leaves might have been sprayed with, I would say one-year-old leaves I wouldn't have any issue using the, those at all. But if you're using them to make leaf mulch or a, a leaf mulch, uh, the, the spreading out of the leaves on the soil, the sun plays a huge factor in dissipating any chemicals that might be on those leaves as well. In addition to in that interface between the mulch and the soil, the soil life is going to do a great job at, at, at achieving the same thing. Whatever might be on those leaves is gonna dissipate in the sun and with the microorganisms that begin to break it down. And so I, I wouldn't be worried at all. In fact, um, most of the mulch I use is at least nine, mulch, nine months old. I'll, I'll get bagged leaves typically in October and I'm not putting those leaves on my garden beds typically until May, June, July, or August. And so almost all the leaves I'm using are aged leaves. I've never had an issue. I, in fact, I actually prefer aged 
uh, materials just in case there is something that might have been sprayed on those leaves. So uh, I say go for it, Yankee Sister. Use the, the one-year-old leaves uh, as a mulch. And even if it came from the curbside and it came from a source you don't know, a neighbor down the street, I, I wouldn't be too concerned by that. In fact, um, I've mentioned this in the past. Um, Frank has done a great job giving me leads in the last couple of years. I have no idea where those leaves came from. And so those are the leaves I'm getting in October, essentially curbside bags. And I'm putting them on my bed eight, nine months later. And that's why I'm not that concerned because it's been long enough for any potential problems to have dissipated. So I'd say go for it. Patty is harvesting leaf mold and thinking about putting it in my garlic bed ahead of planting in November in zone 5B. B, what else should I amend my garlic bed with? And so leaf mold is great. Um, and so the nice thing about leaf mold, and, and I've got uh, my videos that I did earlier with my leaf mold and harvesting life, my leaf mold, and I am planning on adding some leaf mold to my soil for my garlic bed that I'll be planting here pretty soon. It is high in the fungal activity that soil needs. And so it's the fungi that's breaking down the leaves primarily. So when you add leaf mold to your soil, you're incorporating fungal activity to your soil. And a good soil should have both the fungal activity and the bacterial activity. And as we've already been talking about, it's compost that is primarily broken down by bacteria. So that's one reason why I'm, I'm looking forward to adding leaf mold to my soil and most of my beds this year because I made my own leaf mold. Compost adds that bacteria component to your soil. Leaf mold adds the fungal component to your soil. So definitely move forward with the plan for the leaf mold, but also add compost or other organic matter that will be additional food for the bacteria. And Dr. Elaine Ingham with the Soil Food Web goes as far as to identify specific ratios for different plants. And so if you do, and I put a link to some information from Elaine Ingham in the description below, but if you do more research into what, what the Soil Food Web is and what Dr. Elaine Ingham recommends, you can find specific information for specific plants as to how much of your soil should be fungal and how much of your soil should be bacterial. And you can actually modify your soil based on what you're putting into your soil in the way of the organic material that's going to become the primary food. So woody materials like the leaves and wood chips in soil are gonna be broken down by the fungus. Well, go ahead and go in the other direction and say that the, the, the compost that isn't fully decomposed and any other uh, vegetables that fall onto the ground that get worked into the soil, you know, all those tomatoes don't get harvested and they fall down and then you work them into the soil, those can be broken down by bacteria. And so you can modify the ratio in your soil. I don't take it to that extreme. And Dr. Ingham suggests getting a microscope and actually looking at the life in your soil so that you can determine what the ratio is to then determine what you're going to add to your soil. Go for it. If you want to take it to that extreme, I think that's incredible. But for most of us, just adding the compost to our soil is enough. And then by adding the crushed leaves, we will naturally be increasing the amount of fungal activity in your soil. And that's the approach I take. Leaf mold just accelerates it because the leaf mold already has some of those spores and some of the, the, the living fungal threads that go back into your soil. But it really should be a mix. If you want to have the best soil that you can have, you want to look at both of those organisms to have a pretty large role in providing the nutrients for the plants at some point. So uh, that's, that's what I would consider. I would go ahead and do compost in addition 
to the leaf mold that, that you're adding to your beds. Before I forget, I wanna go ahead and point to the background today. This comes from Brent Perry. And we had showed Brent's garden as a backdrop months ago, and there really wasn't much growing. But at the time, I pointed out how I, I like this garden for a number of reasons, but one in particular is it's on a, a, a part of the, the yard, so you can see lots of trees. And I think one of the other pictures that we had showed months ago showed the neighbor's house and other trees. And so this is like the only sunny spot in his yard, the area that gets full sun. And even though it's right next to the house and it extends into the yard, Sometimes you got to do this, even if it's your front yard and all your neighbors walk by and see what you're doing when you're in the garden. Sometimes you got to do it because that's the only spot that's going to get the sun that your plants need. And so too many of us, I think, are, are embarrassed by our gardens or we're worried what our neighbors are going to think about our gardens. So we hide them away in our backyard, often in an area that doesn't get enough sun and then we wonder why they're just not doing as well as they should. Well, stick them in your front yard for everybody to see and get all the sun that the plants can get. And that may involve containers. Look at this, look at all these grow bags. I think that's just fantastic. And back over here, you can see a, a, a wine barrel, a lot more of the grow bags. And you can grow anything in a grow bag. Look, there's even trellises in the grow bags to support the plants. There's sunflowers, there's uh, all these other flowers. This might be Coreopsis over here to attract the pollinators. There are some in-ground beds right here, but those in-ground beds are surrounded by the grow bags with more trellises set up. I just I just love this. I, I appreciate that you sent this to me again, Brent, because I think it's it's nice to see a garden space from both sides when things aren't growing and then when things are growing again. And so it's it's nice to see it. And particularly, we've been talking about soil and mulch. All of this grass can be used as mulch. And so I, I tried looking in these beds and it looks like there's, there's wood chips or pine needles, but I'm guessing a lot of the mulch in these beds is also grass. Dry grass makes a great mulch and when added to a compost pile, it makes a great nitrogen component. So I don't have a big lawn, but if you've got a lawn, you should definitely be using all of those grass clippings back into your garden, either as a mulch or as a, an ingredient for your, your compost. But um, just, just a really nice balanced garden. I really like this. And, and again, the idea that it's, in the front of the house where people might be walking by and complaining about it, but they're probably also jealous. I mean, look at look at these brassicas that are growing right here. And this, this picture is a, a little older, but I think these are some pepper plants and I think there's some tomato plants growing back there. Hopefully you've had a good harvest since you sent me this picture, uh, but it's it's fantastic. Don't be embarrassed by your garden. Put it out there and grow in bags. Don't think that you have to be limited by just a bed and another bed. You can see that there's another bed right here with the wood frame. Use every part of your garden that you can. If you've got the time and the inclination to grow more plants, but you don't have the space to grow plants, grow in containers. And grow bags are a great way to grow in containers. So thank you for sharing that. And, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to see it again, especially with all the plants growing in it. So I think that's fantastic. Cheyenne, Wyoming, Urban Gardener. I also grow in over 100 containers all around my house. Good for you. I grow better pumpkins and squash in shade than I do in sun. I sure get a lot of compliments from people walking or driving by. There you go. Thank you for sharing that because that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing that people will comment on what you're doing because especially if they're gardened at all, containers is an awful lot. And if you're going to have good plants growing, they're going to be saying some good things. So that's fantastic. I think that's a, that's something to be very proud of. And that's a lot of work. I, I've never done more than a few dozen containers at a time because most of my focus is on my raised beds. But it, it can be a lot of work, but it can be very successful, especially if, if that's your focus and how you want to garden. So I like that. That's, that's great. So Bohemian 
Bohemian Herbology. Nice to see you back. You can't eat the grass. That's a wonderful garden full of yield. I dig it. Awesome. I completely agree. And, and that's why I say I don't have a lawn because I've got plants growing in my lawn to include a lot of, or, or where my lawn used to be. I don't have a lawn. I took out the lawn to put plants in, most of them edibles. So that's definitely the way to do it. Gardens happen like growing in grow bags. Yep. It, this is one of those things, you know, as we approach, those of us that are approaching the end of the season and the rest of you that are starting your season with the springtime, uh, if you're not growing in grow bags, if you're not doing container gardening, add it to your repertoire. Start doing it. And you can start small, just one or two containers, just so you can start seeing how to do it. And you might get hooked and end up doing 100 because it really can be an effective way to do some, some gardening. Mary says, in my new home, I first planted my veggies in my front yard until one morning. I saw soil and green tomato trail on the footpath going down the road. <laughs> That's too bad. Somebody took the plant, but... Uh, that's funny. Yeah, that, that is the problem with plants that are open to the public is animals or people might actually take them from you. Uh, Lily's wondering, can I grow avocado trees in pots? They die when I plant them in the ground. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, avocados can actually do pretty well in, in containers. Uh, take some time and the conditions have to be right. My, I'm too cold and dry for me to grow to even think about growing avocados outside. Uh, but I know gardeners even here in Colorado who have avocado trees growing inside their house in pots. And so uh, it's it's like with lemon trees or any type of citrus tree. There's uh, are um, fig trees. You know, there's a lot of small trees like that that can actually be grown in pots. They'll require pruning and they'll require fertilizer because you've got to keep them small enough and under control to grow them indoors. And you might not get uh, much fruit and especially avocados, unless you're growing from a cutting, you're not going to get the avocado that you're used to from the store. But it, it can happen and it's a, it's a nice experiment and it's a good way to kind of stretch what you do. So I say give it a try got nothing to lose except a pot and some soil and some of your time. So yeah, Masabi Gal says, I agree that keeping grow bags watered in dry conditions is a pain. And that's a big reason why I don't do more because in my dry, hot summer, uh, I, I definitely have to water the grow bags once a day, usually twice a day because they, they will dry out faster than an in-ground bed or, or even a raised bed. So, uh, it, you, you, you raise a good point. That's one of the things about containers is taking into account how dry your conditions are. Yankee Sista says, I always combine my garden containers with flowers. Good idea. Neither side of my neighbor's garden, beautiful lawns only. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, um, yeah, flowers. And that's, that's another thing. When we think about our gardening, and, and you hear me say this all the time, growing the pollinators, and the plants that are attracting the beneficial insects. You can do that in the same beds that you're growing other plants. You can also use containers for this. So you've got a bed that's just your vegetables. Well, do what Brent's doing here. Put some containers around your vegetable garden beds and grow flowers in there as well. Or as Yankee Sista says, to actually combine the the different flowers and and beneficial attracting plants in the same beds that you're growing the plants you're going to be harvesting from. Absolutely. I think that's that's some really good ideas to just mix it up and have all the plants growing everywhere. That's really going to attract the, the maximum amount of the good bugs. Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, Rachel raises a good point. Grow bags are vital as a renter. And, and I've, I, I suggest that if I am asked the question for people who are renting and want to garden, and say, they'll, they'll often say, I can't garden because I'm renting. Oh, but of course you can garden, like Rachel. Gardening grow bags. You're not digging up the landlord's yard. You're using spot on a balcony or a deck or a sidewalk or a driveway to have a garden as a renter. So great idea. Absolutely a great idea, Rachel. I'm glad to hear that you're doing that because 
that's one of those things that uh, can make a huge difference. Gail says, for next year's plan, add several grow bags along the fence line. What size would you recommend for squash and peas, etc.? And so, um, it, it, the, the size of the grow bag is important. And so you can see these grow bags, these might be 10 gallon grow bags. Uh, you can grow just about anything in a grow bag that is 10 gallons or bigger. Um, I was growing squash in a 10 gallon grow bag and they did fine. Of more importance is how many plants you're growing in that grow bag. So peas, for instance, you can group peas pretty close together. So in a 10 gallon grow bag like this, you might be able to grow six, eight, 10 pea plants, but I would only put one zucchini plant or maybe two yellow squash plants. So, so there's, it's a double question and a double answer is match the plant to the size of the container and match the number of plants growing to the size of the container. And so um, depending on the squash, I would say 10 gallons is, is a good minimum to think about. And then you can go much bigger than that and you gr can grow more than one plant if you go bigger than that. And then with uh, carrots or peas or spinach or lettuce, you can grow a lot of those plants in a single grow bag as long as you provide the space in between the plants that the plants need. And, and that's, that's an important factor as well. The different plants will require different amounts of spacing. And as long as the plant has enough space, as long as the soil is providing the nutrients, the plant's going to grow. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, Juanita says, I use about a dozen rubber made totes with holes drilled in the bottom for drainage. The third year with those and they're doing great. Yeah. You don't have to use a grow bag. You don't have to use a five gallon bucket. I like the idea of using a rubber made tote. A container is a container. And as long as you match the plant appropriately, you can grow in anything. Cheyenne, Wyoming Urban Gardener uses two gallon containers for tomatillos and they work just fine. Um, I, <clears throat> I like to get the four gallon containers. That's what they sell them or not sell. That's what they, they have frosting in and I go to my supermarket bakery and ask for the buckets after they've used all the frosting. Those are four gallon buckets. And I've grown <clears throat> tomato plants and actually haven't done tomatillos in those buckets, but I've done a lot of peppers and tomato plants in a four gallon container. Absolutely. So definitely something to think about. And especially uh, as, as they point out, pots with the water trays from Dollar Tree can definitely work. <clears throat> you put the you put the bucket on one of those those wheeled uh, trays and you can rotate it. That's one of the nice things that I like about my green stock vertical planter is it rotates either on wheels or if you get the spinner with the, the green stock. And so I have those sitting on my deck. It's a container garden and I spin them around as needed so that all the sides get sun. Great idea. Get one of those those wheel trays from Dollar Tree or wherever you can find them cheap. Put your container on top of it. And now you can rotate the container to take advantage of the sun and roll it around to take advantage of extra sun. So yeah, definitely some good ideas with that. I like that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Mary says beets, garlic, and lettuce are shallow and they can go in any container. And, and, and that's that's the way to look at it is just matching it up and what you want to grow and then grow it. Try not to be held back by limitations in your garden space. <laughs> Make more space with a container. Brian says my entire front trellis is 25 gallon grow bags. Tomatoes, peppers, loofah, cucumbers, basil, dill, and of course flowers. Yeah, and a 25 gallon grow bag, uh, the, the sky's the limit. And so good, good for you, Brian. I like that idea with the bigger grow bags. Essentially, you're creating um, more raised beds. 25 gallon bags are pretty big. There's a lot of soil in there. You can definitely uh, grow a lot of stuff. So, uh, <clears throat> so this has been a great week for me. I mentioned that I'm just loving my my freeze dryer and 
already done some loads of squash and the zucchini. The zucchini is turning out incredibly. But as I'm having so much fun with my freeze dryer, I've got one more zucchini to harvest. And it'll probably be ready tomorrow. And then my zucchini is done for the year. And yellow squash, I've had a great season of yellow squash. I've got maybe three or four that will be harvested in the next week and they're done. My beans have all been harvested. Like the video I just did recently, the many of the bean, well, the beans that I saved to go to seed, many of them have already dried and are ready to harvest like I did with the pinto beans. It's the end of the season for me. And it's been a really good year for me. This is the best tomato and pepper year I've had in a long time. The problem is, this is the end of the season for me. This can be a depressing time for many gardeners because we've been go, 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 grow, grow, grow. And then we finally get to the harvest time and we're harvesting and we're using and we're preserving. And then it stops. And now what? Don't get sad about the garden season being over. Don't think in terms of it being over. There's still a lot of work that can be done. There's still those cleanup efforts. There's the analysis. What happened in your garden? What went right? What went wrong? Don't just stop and say, oh, woe is me. My garden is dead. I had my first frost. The plants aren't producing anymore. I'm sad. Don't be sad. Instead, like with me, what what went right? I grew some plants in the greenhouse, some tomatoes and peppers. The tomatoes did great. The peppers did pretty good. Surprisingly, for the first time ever, I think, the peppers outside did better than the peppers that I grew in the greenhouse. Now I have to figure out why. What was it that I did differently? I think the difference for me is soil. The bed that I grew my peppers in this year was the very first bed that I built three years ago. It's the bed that I have in my video three years ago on how to fill a raised bed. It's the video or it's the same bed that I had a video two years ago on how to amend the soil in your raised bed. That bed has the best soil of any other bed in my garden because it was the very first bed I amended and I've kept up with it. The soil is good. The soil in my greenhouse <coughs> is new soil. I just started it. I just started amending it. It's only had less than a season to get good. And so the same plants that are growing in my greenhouse that are growing outside, it's the soil that's making the difference. So now, end of season, I'm not sad at all. I'm enthusiastic because this is one of those things that tells me yes soil is important it is key to garden success and the more attention i devote to my soil the better the plants are going to be so it has me looking ahead what am i going to do for the rest of my beds to amend them over the course of the next couple of months and then expect another great season next year and what can i do in my greenhouse over the course of this winter to help that soil catch up to the soil that's already got a three-year advantage on it. So I'm, I'm not down at all. My plants aren't producing harvest anymore, but I'm looking forward to the future. Brian sent me a note today that, that I, I want to share some of his words, which are, it's the end of the season. Yes, you can, you'll be out and and it's easy to feel melancholy, but many of us, to include Brian, love gardening and we love the process and we love the growing season. And in Brian's words, the love will be back next year. I love that idea. Yeah, we love what we do and then suddenly it stops. It doesn't mean that that love goes away. It might diminish, it might change a little bit, but it will return. And a year from now, I'll be sitting in this same chair, probably talking about the same thing about 
the sadness of the end of the season. Absolutely. And it's okay to mourn the death of your plants, but it shouldn't be your focus. There are so many other things you can be looking at. It's the planning. I'm already planning what I'm going to grow next year for peppers. I had such a good pepper year and it just was so much fun to see those plants do well that next year I'm expanding. I'm going to be growing a lot more peppers, different types of peppers inside the greenhouse, outside the greenhouse, using different methods, making more videos, of course, about growing peppers. But I'm looking forward to that. And it is nine months until I can put a pepper plant in the ground. And I'm already planning putting those pepper plants in the ground. That's why I think this time of year, even though the plants are producing, it just gets me excited thinking about next year because I know that love will return next year and it gives me something to look forward to and it gives me something to plan for. And I think that's one of the biggest parts about gardening that I like. It's what I'm looking forward to. What am I going to do that's new and exciting and different and hopefully successful? So start thinking about that over the course of the next week and the next couple of months as the season wanes for many of us, don't let it get you down. Don't be sad that the season is over. Instead, look at it as that opportunity to highlight the good things that you want to repeat and those new things that you want to try. And you can tell I'm excited because it really is a, a fun and favorite time of year for me as I start thinking about those things that are going to work. Colorado Birdner, thank you so much for this. Popped in late, but looking forward to the replay. I appreciate that super chat. And yes, I look forward to you joining us on replay. And as always, of course, I look forward to seeing all of you again next Monday when we get the opportunity to do this all over again. As you look to next year, <clears throat> excuse me, as you look to next year and the success you're going to have, Think about your soil. Think about what you can do to increase the life in your soil. It's going to be work. It's going to be some effort. You're going to have to add that organic materials, but you can do it. And as I pointed out with my peppers, it's so incredibly satisfying when you can see that it works. And it really does work if you take the time and energy and effort to make it happen. Hope you have a great gardening week. I'm going to get outside now and try to find some of the last of the harvest of some of those plants before I pull those plants and amend the soil and make everything better for next year. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being a gardener. Thanks for being part of this community. And I'll see you next week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.